Oh, hi. Sorry, dog in my face. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our second to last lecture for this class and then the final. Um, I was able to look at some of your how can I help you guys with online. I, um, I guess I'll just give you guys some of my thoughts. You guys all seemed awesome, totally reasonable. Um, I'm going to try to share some uh, common questions that everyone's having so that we can all learn from each other. The reason I set the class up this way instead of through a Zoom conference class is because I know what it's like having a weird work schedule and just like some of you and it's kind of hard to find a time unless we do our scheduled time so that way you guys can just get this done at your pace whenever you have a free moment. So that being said, we're just going to continue on and I should have everything up and posted before too long and it's going to be great. Just this lecture is the same. Uh, will be well. The content will be different, but it will be exactly the same as the other le two lectures we've done online. I hope you're all doing well. I do miss you. Um. Again, I'm available if you guys need anything. I know everyone's kind of in survival mode right now, but if you need help with this class or whatever, let me know. I'm more than happy to help. So let's get started. This today's lecture subject is on ventilator weaning, which is actually something I very much enjoy as a respiratory therapist. I love being able to bring support down and hopefully extubate and get our patient off the ventilator. It it's work and you'll you're very actively involved, but it's work that's fun because a your patient's getting better and B, you get to use all your skills, and that's why I think it's fun, because you're kind of the star of the show, and you get to see your patient improving, so it's the good busy. I never mind being the good busy when I'm at work. So our topics today split up into three sections. So ventilator weaning, we're going to go over both slow wean and rapid wean. Um, you can kind of split it up into two. Patients that are sick and weak versus the healthy, just wake them up, get the tube out. We are going to touch on compliance in this. I know it's not really anything to do with weaning, but it is as good as any time to talk about compliance. So we're just going to touch on that. And then terminal weaning. We're going to, it's kind of a heavy subject, but it needs to be addressed. But... I try to put a really positive spin on it, you can, so I just want to ease some of your concerns. Okay, get started on weaning. When Right after intubation, our number one goal is extubation. If there's anything you can learn from this lecture, it is that, that the first goal of intubation is extubation, and that we need to actively work towards getting that tube out and getting that patient back into a normal state. So it's not, once we get the tube in, we need to see how long we can keep the tube in. I mean, you know, you want to have it be a planned extubation, but you also want to actively work towards weaning, um, decreasing support as the patient tolerates, and getting that tube out and getting them healthy and better. There's a couple reasons for this, because a lot of patients will you increase risk for pneumonia, increase risk for infection, um, barotrauma from positive pressure. So there's lots of reasons why any time we're extubated, it's the best time. Sorry, class dog is being real needy today. All right, so sometimes when you're weaning, you're like, where do I even begin? I'm just handed this patient. I don't even know where to begin. So we begin between by asking ourselves, is the underlying issue resolved? And this is think acute. Is this um, a sedation issue? Do we just need, to, is the patient stable from surgery and we need to wake them up from sedation? I know I use that analogy a lot, but it's something you do a lot. Um, 
there are some issues like chronic issues, COPD, where the COPD will never resolve. It's a chronic issue. It's always going to be there. But is the exacerbation that led to the intubation resolved? Are we to this patient's baseline? Um, is the, I'm just trying to think of other examples for you guys. Is the upper airway swelling that came from allergic reaction resolved and we have a leak? Um, a few other ones like that. So I always just think, is my underlying issue, are we okay? After that, you move to your physical assessment. If there's anything I can preach to you guys, it's that physical assessment and your assessment is the most powerful thing you can have to take care of your patient. So you look, how is my patient looking? Before I even look at the vent, you look at your patient. So you think, okay, are we comfortable? Do we look like we're breathing easy? Or are we sucking to our spine and we're sweaty and clammy and we have giant eyes? Or are we just comfortable? Are we triggering additional breaths? You can tell that by looking at the respiratory rate. Say you have a set rate of 12 and your patient's breathing 20. They are breathing above and triggering their own additional breaths. Um, do we have a stable blood gas? Is our chest x-ray either normal or improving? Are we reaching appropriate volumes for our current settings along with our vital signs? If my patient it looks great on the vent, but let's say their blood pressure is 60 over 30, I'm not going to want to extubate at that time. If my patient is triggering additional breasts, but their blood gas is like a 729.56 CO2, I'm going to want to hold off until I have that gas stabilized. Same with appropriate volumes and vital signs. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping back and forth on this list. Um, it, do I have a patient that is getting 200? Let's say they're a 6'2 man and they're breathing 200 milliliter tidal volumes on five of pressure support. They're not ready. They're not fully awake or they're not strong enough. Um, making sure that their volumes are appropriate for where they need to be. And finally, can they manage their secretions? I like to ask myself, could this patient cough this up? Could this patient take a nice deep breath and clear their secretions? Because I've had situations where that's the closest thing to, um, that's the only thing keeping them from being extubated is they just have tons and tons of secretions and they're basically drowning in secretions and I'm just, and they have a weak cough and, and I'm not comfortable extubating at that time until the secretions get under control. So that's where we begin. After that, we are going to think to ourselves, is this patient a fast wean or a slow wean? I like to think, I like, with a rapid wean, I like to push my patient because sedation is the primary problem most of the time. You guys that will work ICUs, especially surgical and cardio, this is something you will do a lot of. And again, I love it. it you're very active. You're very involved. Sedation is a primary key once they are stabilized from their surgery or whatever. If they had a fractured pelvis and we got it put it back into place. You are going to be very active and in that room a lot. Um, making changes, regulating the ABG, and decreasing support. So when I go in, I typically will go in and put them on these basic settings. I do a rate of 20 because my logic is a lot of the times they keep the patient slightly acidotic in the OR. Um, so that will kind of help me regulate my CO2 back to where it needs to be. I, I use pressure control most of the time. That's kind of my flavor of choice. There's nothing wrong with volume. It's just my choice. Um, I'll do a PIP of around 12 because we should have pretty healthy lungs, at, but I'm okay with a slightly bigger tidal volume, around seven or eight mils per kilogram on a post-operative patient. 
I will put my peep at eight to allow for a little bit of recruitment. Five is also appropriate anywhere you need it to be. You know, you go off your patient. This is just respiratory according to Allie. Because a lot of anesthesiologists will use no peep or barely any peep. So I want to help recruit these lungs, really open them up. I call it using, I call it my tune-up settings. I just, I'm giving these lungs a nice big tune-up before we work on weaning. And then my FIO2, I start at 60 because they were already intubated. They're coming to me on, after the OR, but then I can wean fast. Most of the time, most patients don't need 60%, but I must start high and then bring down kind of RT. Okay, regulate the ABG. We want that in a happy place. So once the patient starts treating their additional breaths and you can switch over to pressure support from assist control and you can start with a higher pressure support number such as 10, 12, 15 until they start waking up a little bit more. And then I always check that the patient is stable because sometimes they'll make a turn and maybe they start bleeding somewhere or they might be brewing an infection somewhere. Um, another thing I would say is, uh, I very is don't create a soothing environment. When I do this, I turn on all the lights in the room. I turn the TV on. I bring the fam, the spouse or the child in. I sit them up pretty high. I'm like, you are not falling asleep. You need to wake up and we need to get this tube out. We're not making a nice soothing environment for you to rest. This is not the time you can rest after I get the tube out. I, some people will say use SIMV and that is appropriate. That's their style. My personal belief is either all or nothing. Either you are on assist control and then you're awake and we put you to pressure support. I very rarely will use SIMV. I have used it, but if it's a wake and yank, um, then it needs to, we need to get going. I, I kind of push my patients. I'm like, hey, it's time to wake up. Okay, wake up. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and put our secret word right here, and it's going to be wake and yank because we got to wake them up and yank it out. That's rapid weaning, slow weaning. Um, this is usually over days or weeks, even months sometimes. This is for small changes and that are tolerated as a patient. We go more off the patient than off of our need to get the tube out on these ones because the patient probably is pretty sick if they are needing a slower wean. This could be they have a major trauma, they are a major heart condition, neurological conditions, pulmonary conditions, anything that's basically traumatic um, and a long heal for these patients. So super severe ARDS or neurological issues, or I have a patient right now that I've taken care of that got a bilateral lung after having cystic fibrosis her whole life. And she's doing great, but we have to do a slower wean on her and that's totally appropriate. So this is where, um, so some strategies that we use would be either a higher pressure support or another thing we'll do is T piece. And what this is, is you get flow. You can either do this by setting up an HLVN because you're bypassing the upper airway. So you want a heated large volume nebulizer or else I am, my favorite thing to do is get a high flow system because then you don't get as much sloshy in the circuit. Um, and then you take one end off of the, your suction catheter and hook the other end so that there's an exhalation and the Humidity goes across, but you still have your suction available and have the patient breathe on their own. So you can just give humidified um, aerosol and oxygen. And then a lot of times we'll rest them on the ventilator at night and it will just be pretty typical settings like a pressure support of eight over eight, 
just to help them rest so that they can work hard in the day. Oh, hi, Artie. Um, this is a time I am a believer in SIMV because sometimes when you're doing a slow wean, they, they get tired. It's like training for, it's, think of it as training for a marathon for them. It's a lot of work. So you might have to work on decreasing the rate while helping support their um, spontaneous breaths. So SIMV is very appropriate. Um, and then another strategy is actually decreasing the physical support, which is a lot of times patients with slow weaning strategies, a lot of them end up with trachs. So, um, with the trachs, what they'll typically do is they'll start with like an 8 trach and then they'll go to a 6 and then they might put a fenestrated one in and then maybe a 4 without a cuff and then they'll cap, um, which is they block the actual airway um, so that they're totally breathing on their own with their upper airway and then they'll do what's called decannulate where they take the trach out with an endotracheal tube what they might do if or it's been a slower wean but we don't need to trach them is we'll extubate to high flow or extubate to bipap and this is a pretty common move you guys will see a lot of doctors are doing is extubate sooner but use non-invasive support to support the patients and Honestly, I've actually seen this be pretty successful most of the time. I am a believer in high flow. BiPAP's awesome. I do think BiPAP is a very great intervention, but high flow, it's easier to get the patient to be compliant. So that's rapid versus slow weaning. So when you put your patient on your weaning trial, you can either put them on a pressure support of five over five, and then, and then either 40% or lower, because that can be supported by a nasal cannula, um, or 0 over 5. That's just dependent on the therapist. I like 5 over 5 because I feel like if I was breathing through a straw, but 0 over 5 is totally appropriate. You guys will develop what works for you. So you'll constantly monitor your vital signs, so your heart rate, blood pressure, SpO2, your patient. You'll always watch your patient. Make sure they're doing okay. If they're getting sweaty or to kipnik or anything, then you'll want to stop immediately. You will stop the weaning trial or SBT immediately if not tolerated. So don't be like, oh, we'll give them a little longer, we'll give them a little longer. If they're in distress, stop the trial. The next trial, this is in Lindsay Jones. So the ne next trial, you decrease the time instead of meet the time that where they became intolerant. So. The example would be, let's say this patient went two hours on a weaning trial, but at two hours and 15 minutes they started being intolerant of the SBT, you would go back to two hours. So as think of it as they're running intervals. You don't want to exhaust them, but you want to work them. Um, biggest thing is I watch respiratory rate and return volume. So I watch rate, tidal volume, and minute volume. Make sure those are appropriate. So again, SBTs are performed on either a 5 over 5 or 0 over 5 pressure support with a minimum of 30 to 60 minutes. The slow weans, typically we just watch them as we make a change. I, If it's a post-op and they're interacting with me and able to lift their head off the pillow and are alert and oriented, I do 30. Um, but I think Lindsay Jones says 60. So... Okay, SBT time. So our patient tolerated 5 over 5 or 0 over 5 for 30 minutes. Our volumes were great. Um, and then I do what I like to call the baby deer cheerleader strategy. So how I do it, I'll go in and I'll change my settings to 5 over 5. And then I turn my screen so that I can either see it from the window. A lot of ICs will have big windows in each room or out to the door and then I just chill nearby. I'll either go check on another patient while I'm still listening or just sit outside and hang out with the nurse 
Because I know if it were me and I had somebody standing in the room staring at me breathing for a half hour, I would not breathe comfortably or appropriately. And that's my logic is this patient, you're just going to be staring at him. You're like, hey, what's up? So that's why I make it so I can very closely monitor my patient. But at the same time, I'm not staring at him like a creep. So baby deer. I like, these are the values I like to get before I even walk in the room. So I'll get their respiratory rate, their tidal volume, their minute volume, and their RSBI. You might have to touch the vent to get the RSBI. Remember, this is respiratory rate divided by tidal volume. We're going to go over the values on the next slide. So I'll get these and I'll write them down. I, re I literally write these on a little piece of paper on my little assignment sheet. So that, cause I'm going to forget them. I'm not going to be like, oh, their rate was this, blah, blah, blah. And that way I can just show the doctor when we're done what my SBT is. All right. And then we move over to our cheerleader strategy. So our baby deer, we don't want to spook the baby deer. You want to be quiet. You want to be sneaky. Don't scare the baby deer. And now it's time to get loud and proud with your cheerleader. So your values obtained. These are what you have to coach your patient to get. So this would be vital capacity. And what I tell them is I tell them, take the biggest, deepest breath in you can and blow all the air out of your lungs until you feel like there's no more air in your lungs. And then I just say, go, 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 go. Get all that air out. Keep going, keep going. And this is where I watch the exhale tidal volume. That's where you, you will get this value is by looking at exhale tidal volume. NIF. This can either be done the old school way with a manometer where you block it, like we practice in lab, but a lot of the newer ventilators have a NIF maneuver involved. So what I tell them is, I want you, it's gonna feel like I'm putting my hand over this breathing tube or you're taking a drink from a big thick milkshake. What I want you to do is use your tummy muscles, use your chest muscles, use all your muscles to just keep pulling and try to take the biggest, deepest breath in you can. And then I maneuver it so that, so on the 980 when I do it is I start it as they're just about to complete their exhalation. I'll initiate it because there's a touch of a lag by like one or two seconds. So then it will, the maneuver will initiate when they go to take that breath in. <sighs> Sometimes if you have a patient, this is a, um, do it. you didn't hear this from me. <laughs> um, if you have a patient that's not really doing well on the vital capacity, you can make them really work on the NIF. And then when you release the maneuver, you can watch it and they might actually give you a better vital capacity. You didn't hear that from me because it's not nice, but it works. Um, and then I assess their cough. I just do this by suctioning down the tube, watch them cough, their gag. I do this by, it. you don't have to get like a full on like a retching gag, um, just as long as they look like they're going to protect their airway. So I'll do this by suctioning above the cuff and the back of the throat. And then this simultaneously works because I, when I check my leak, I don't want any of those secretions or anything above the cuff falling into the lungs. So when I, that's why I always check my gag by suctioning the back of the throat before I deflate the cuff to check for a leak. Another thing I didn't learn until I was a practicing RT is I increase my pressure support up to like 15, 20 when I check for a leak, just so that I have additional air and I can hear that leak really loud. So that's how I collect my SBT. After that, I put them back on like a little bit of pressure support just to relax while we go talk with the doctor and set up for extubation. That's pretty fast after, but I'll put them on like eight over five just so that they can catch their breath and we'll be good to go. So here's our values we want. With an SBT, we typically want the rate anywhere from 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Tidal volume a minimum of five mils per kilogram. Minute volume anywhere between five and 10. But this is one of those if the patient's on minimal and they have super healthy lungs and they're breathing like a 12, 13 minute volume, I'm like, good for you, man, you, you do that. Um, vital capacity, a minimum of 10 mils per kilogram 
or if you just want to do easy math, I just try to get around, get above a liter. <laughs> um, times I'm okay with less than a liter is if I have this like f little five foot one grandma, but she's like has attitude and is ready to have it out, then I'm like, I believe in you. But if I had like a six foot tall man give me like 800, I'd be like, no, I need above a liter from him. Nif, you want it negative 20 or more negative. So like negative 30 is better than negative 10. RSBI, it's respiratory rate divided by tidal volume. You want it less than 106. Most doctors will actually want it less than 80. This is an objective value to measure the indication of work of breathing. So the lower the number, the lower the work of breathing. The higher the number, the higher the work of breathing. Cough, they're able to clear their own secretions. Gag, they're able to protect their own airway. And leak indicates swelling around the upper airway. Okay, extubation. This is a be as prepped as you can. So gather your stuff. If it's like a, we're gonna extubate and be fine. All you need is a cannula, um, oral suction, and a chucks. Um, but if say you're extubating to high flow, make sure that's set up before you extubate. Extubating to BiPAP, make sure that's set up to extubate. Suction above and below the cuff. And then what I do is I remove the holder, but I don't deflate the cuff just yet. And I just hold the tube and put my wrist on their chin so that their tube's in place, but the holder is off. I silence the vent or I just turned it off at this point. I'll disconnect it um, at the inspiratory limb up by the ventilator. So it's clean air that's blowing out of the vent and not patient contaminated air. And then I'll just turn the vent off. I'll deflate the cuff, and then as soon as the vent's off, I turn around to the patient, I deflate the cuff, and pull the tube out. And you just do it in a quick, smooth motion. You don't want to yank it out, but you also don't want to just, like, take your sweet time. I always warn patients when I tell them, talk them through it, I always tell them to cough. And I'm like, okay, hey, when I say cough, I want you to keep coughing, and cough even if you feel like you're done coughing. So deep breath in, and cough, 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 cough. And then again, you don't want to like take your sweet time, but you also don't want to hurt them. And then I will pull it out. I'll throw it onto the chucks that I have on their chest. And then I cover it up with my left hand because a patient doesn't really want to see that. It, it looks pretty nasty. It's not the worst thing you guys are going to see. But even if I saw it come out of my mouth, I'd be a little freaked out. I'd be like, oh my gosh, what is that? And so that's why I like to cover it up for the patient. And then suction the mouth, place on supplemental oxygen. And then I do a quick assessment. I listen to their neck after, I listen to their lungs, and I make sure they talk to me. I um, have them say their name. If the family's in the room, I'm like, like let's say it's a cute little old couple. If I And I just extubated the husband. I'll be like, what's this lovely lady's name? And I have them talk to their spouse and all that um, just because I want to assess their vocal cords um, and then make sure their oxygen saturation is good um, it's a few other things clean up your mess because that's a quick way to get hated and then just make sure they are fine and stable before you leave the room some people will leave the ventilator in the room I don't just because I'm like, I'll just get another clean vent if for some reason we have to reintubate. Um, but some people do, and if it's a sketchy extubation. Because sometimes you'll do what are called pull and praise, where you're like, we're not sure, we're kind of borderline. Let's see if they will be successful. And that's extubation. And then I always suction their mouth, and I always instruct them to use a suction instead of swallowing their secretions. Um, and then... They have to have a swallow eval before they can um, drink anything. So just a couple trach thoughts. This is typically a slow wean. 
situation. So you decrease the modes and then the settings. So once we're on assist control and doing okay, we try SIMV and then maybe they'll be fine on pressure support. It's seeing what is best for the patient at that time and you kind of go off what the patient needs. Rest is important. So again, you a lot of the times you will rest either, let's say they were on pressure support in the day, you can rest them on assist control at night or they were on a T-piece trial in the day, you will rest them on pressure support at night on the ventilator, it's very common to rest at night while you are working on weaning attempts. Um, once off the ventilator, continue to monitor ventilatory status. They could still get a plug in their trach and that would cause increased work of breathing. A lot of things can go wrong with a trach, but they're also great for long-term weaning situations. Um, then, like we talked about earlier, you'll decrease the airway size and type, um, get a more narrow diameter so that the patient has to work on their own, less cuff so that the patient can use do more of the work on their own, but we still have access to their airway if we need it. All right, that was the biggest section we're going to talk about. We are going to have a slide on dynamic compliance. So this is the Fix your shit. Um, dynamic, fix your shit. So this is an increase in only peak pressure. This is what you can fix. Dyna think you are the dynamic one that can change the situation. So this is associated with airway resistance. So I like to think of it as anything not affecting the lung tissue or outside of the direct lung tissue. So this could, and this will, you will see a fast fix with this. So let's say that we have a mucus plug. That's a dynamic compliance change. We can fix that with suction. If we have bronchospasm, that is a dynamic compliance change. We give bronchodilator. Let's say the patient's biting on their ET tube. We can put a bite block there and that will fix it. Let's say we have condensation or secretion or condensation in the tube. We can drain that into our little drainage cups and fix our dynamic compliance. Um, so this is only an increase in peak pressure, but your actual lung tissue is not directly affected. So this is the equation. So dynamic compliance, it's the exhaled tidal volume divided by the PIP minus the PEEP. So this is the measured PIP minus the PEEP. That's in Lindsay Jones, so remember that for Lindsay Jones. Okay, static compliance. This is the oh shit. This is the reactionary. So this is the, we need to start looking at what's going on with this patient. So this is an increase in both peak and plateau pressures. This is what directly occurs to the lung tissue. This is what directly affects compliance of the lung. Think of it as you need to react to the change instead of fix the change and support the decreased compliance, whatever it may be. So common ones are ARDS. This would be a static compliance change because we're having decreased compliance on the alveolar level. Pneumonia. We have sick lungs. We have consolidation. So PEEP is commonly your best friend in a static dynamic compliant change situation. This is the static compliance exhale tidal volume, the only difference is it's your plateau pressure minus your PEEP, which you will do by doing an inspiratory hold on your ventilator. You'll press your inspiratory hold, it will, the patient will inhale, it will kind of come down a little, you'll go to peak inhalation, come down a little bit, hold it, measure, and then exhale. And that's static compliance, so static compliance is the oh shit. This is something I found kind of confusing as a student, so hopefully it makes a little bit of sense to you guys. Let me know if you guys need other examples of compliance, the difference between static and dynamic compliance. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is a little bit heavy, but I really want to address it, and here's why. We, as respiratory therapists, get to work very closely and intimately with this 
side of healthcare. We are the ones running actual life support. We're the ones saving lives, but sometimes we're the one that have to take off the life support to have a patient pass away. So terminal weaning is the withdrawal of life support. Here's a few things I like to, the, like the mechanics of a terminal wean. A lot of times this will be decided um, as a group. It will be a family, it will be the doctor, the nurse, and you. Um, they'll also sometimes include religious leaders and social work in these situations. Um, I like to create a calm environment. I like to be as invisible. This is just me. I like to be as invisible as I can be in these situations because at that time, um, you're there for the family. Um, and that's why I say you use simple terms of the family. So I like to go in and then I just explain whoever wants to be here when I withdraw life support. You are more than welcome to stay. Um, there might be a couple sounds that some might find disturbing. So if you want to step out while we get them settled, you can come right back in as soon as we take the tube out and then you guys can work on saying your goodbyes. And so I give them the option of whether they want to stay or leave because it's whatever the family is comfortable with. And if family wants to stay, absolutely. One thing I would say is keep the vent as quiet as possible. So I will make sure my silence button is my best friend, try to turn my vent off without it alarming. I'll turn my vent completely off before I um, take the tube out. I will try to suction without trying to get a response from the patient, depending on what's going on. If they are brain dead, then you shouldn't have to worry about it. But if they are still kind of with it, just be careful with your suctioning. Um, and then my biggest thing I want to talk to you guys about is treat this as a service to the family and to the patient. I remember being a student thinking like, oh my gosh, am I going to be killing people? No, what you are doing is you are providing a comfort and a service and you are there to care for this person in their last few moments. This person would have died without your help. You were able to give this family a nice time to be with their loved one and grieve and mourn. You guys are healers. And sometimes as healers, you heal the family more than the patient. And you provide comfort in that patient's last moments. And there's nothing more noble than that, than caring for somebody in the last few moments of their life. This is something that I'm... I'm religious, but I treat it as a sacred responsibility to care for these patients because they're about to end their, have their life be over and on to the next part of their life. And so I just try to create an environment of peace and care and be a comfort for the family and for the patient. Um, so do little things like make sure the tube is, when you pull the tube out, cover it as fast as possible. I'll even cover it as I'm pulling the tube out so the family doesn't have to see that. I make the patient as comfortable as I can. I am extra careful taking off the holder so that they look nice for the family and for their future services. Um, but just treat it as a time to care and to serve. That's the biggest thing I could say is you get to be a comforter and it's a different role as a caregiver. So you get to give care and comfort in a different way when you do a terminal wean or terminal extubation. That being said, one thing I really want to talk to you guys about too is self-care. Um, there will be some terminal weans where you are perfectly comfortable it's an older person it's the end of their life and it's a very 
and the family is appropriate and it's actually a pretty lovely experience. Other times, it can be a little, it can be very traumatic. I have some situations that I've been in that have been just horrible, quite honestly. So a few things I want to tell yourself is allow yourself to grieve. You're human. You are not a robot. You are, you can allow yourself to grieve these patients that you care for. Um, find what is a healthy coping mechanism that works best for you. Um, a few of mine, I have to wash their face after I withdraw. Um, I was a CNA before I was an RT, and I think that's kind of where it came from. I have to make sure that before I leave the room, I have to make sure they look nice and their face is clean and they look appropriate and lovely and they are comfortable and in a safe, warm environment before I can leave that patient after I withdraw. Um, another thing is talking to someone you trust. So... Um, yeah, I've been in crappy situations, but I have people I've been able to turn to to talk to it about. Um, I'll just tell you guys, two weeks ago, I was in a newborn resuscitation that was very traumatic for me. Um, we got the heart rate back and everything, but the baby basically was... I have no idea how we got this baby back. The baby was dead long before it even got to our warmer, but... Um, I was able to talk it through with my coworker and my mom, because my mom was a 40-year NICU nurse, and that really helped me process it and figure it out and kind of break down what happened, my guilt, even though it wasn't my fault, but, um, I still carried some guilt for what happened, um... And, um, allow, again, allowing myself to grieve over this lost life that we had. Um, so find out what works for you, whether it's you need to meditate, you like to exercise. You can visit Taco Bell and get their breakfast Crunchwrap Supremes and cry in your car if you need to. This might be a specific example that has happened. Um... Find what is healthy. Don't look for unhealthy mechanisms to grieve because there are a lot of healthy ones out there. Um, reach out if you guys are in a tough environment and you really want need to talk to somebody or something traumatic happened and you don't know how to process it. Reach out. That's the biggest thing I'd say. Um, seek out professional help if you need it. There's no thing embarrassing or wrong if you need to talk to somebody or you need some help that's totally appropriate we deal with hard things every day in this profession and i just want to give you guys every tool you can in order to be successful but also healthy and protect yourself um, um i've had to seek out professional help myself and i've been very grateful that i did so if you guys feel that is necessary i have different resources i can line you up with please feel free to um reach out to me and remember you are not alone and you are allowed to be human um you are allowed to cry and feel those feelings um because that's part of the grieving and processing process um I mean, I wasn't wailing, but I was crying at that bedside two weeks ago, at that baby's bedside. Um, you don't have to be a robot. Um, but again, talk, talk it out with someone you trust. Find something healthy you can do, whether it be play a game with some, spend time with those you love, play a game with them, exercise, meditate, anything like that just so that you guys learn to protect yourself. And remember, um, it's a team effort and everyone's there for each other. We've all been through hard things, especially 
uh, some more veteran RTs that are with you. So please reach out to those you trust. Um, and the last thing is, let me know if you have any questions. This will be posted, um, same questions and everything. Um, happy social distancing, everybody. Um, you can feel free to share different stories or examples in your guys' responses, whatever you need. And then Artie is proud of all of you, and we miss you, and have a good rest of your day. Bye, guys.